Thanks for joining us on this Jeremy Bamber Case podcast. In this episode, we'll explore the evidence of a grey hair attached to the sound moderator and given to the police. This hair later disappeared, but was raised during the 1986 trial of Jeremy Bamber. In the prosecution account of what happened at White House Farm, Essex police said that a grey hair was discovered on the moderator, found in the gun cupboard by David Beauflower. This was when he was in the company of his sister Anne Eaton and father Robert Beauflower, who were the extended family and ultimate beneficiaries of the Bamber estate. This was the second moderator to be found, and we'll discuss how we know this and can prove this in later presentations. According to the police and the prosecution, this grey hair showed that Neville Bamber was hit over the head by Jeremy using the rifle with a sound moderator attached to it thereby supporting two prosecution issues. Firstly, that the scratch damage to the aga and the paint within the knurl pattern of the moderator showed that Jeremy must have been the perpetrator. This was supported by the blood discovered inside the moderator, which matched the group of Sheila. And this proved that the sound moderator was attached to the rifle during the incident. On the 10th of August 1985, three days after the tragedy, Anne, David and Robert seized a number of items from the house, including all of the guns which had not been collected by the police in the gun cupboard during their scenes of crime work. The relatives discovered a moderator, a magazine, telescopic sights and bullets which they put into a carrier bag. By their own admission in statements... Whilst there, they also took any jewellery they came across, removed pictures from the walls, took money from June's handbags and even stole £400 in cash from Neville's wallet. The items were loaded into Anne's car and taken to Oak Farm, the home she shared with her husband, Peter. That evening, sat around Anne's table, Peter, Anne and David examined the contents of the carrier bag and all looked at the moderator. David testified at trial that during this examination he made strenuous attempts to get to the baffle plates inside. Weeks later, after Jeremy's first arrest, Anne and David stated that they'd seen a blob of blood and a speck of red paint on the moderator, which makes it very questionable as to why David would wish to unscrew it while holding this contaminated end nut. After the examination around the kitchen table had concluded, the moderator was placed back in the carrier bag, along with the telescopic sight and ammunition. It was then stored under the stairs at Anne's home. Two days later, on the 12th of August 1985, DS Stan Jones went to Anne's farm to collect the moderator from Peter Eaton. And whilst there, Jones examined the moderator and stated in evidence... I also saw that on the side of the moderator there was a scratch mark with a burr and attached to this burr was a grey coloured hair, about three quarters of an inch long. In his 4th of November statement, Peter said, Although I did not mention it in my previous statement, I remember that the silencer had a piece of hair attached to the silencer which was grey in colour and about one inch long. I remember Sergeant Jones pointing out the hair to me after I had handed the silencer over to him. Asked at trial if he'd seen a grey hair when he examined the silencer, David Beauflower said, Not at the time. I've heard reference to this hair through the court and on the television news media, but I'm afraid I can't elaborate any further on that. D.S. Jones alleges that the only item he collected that day was the moderator, which he put inside a kitchen towel tube. D.S. Jones gave evidence. I hadn't got suitable packaging, having examined it, to put the silencer in, so I got a kitchen roll holder, in fact, this is a piece of it, and put one end round, put a peg on it, and carefully put the silencer in and bent the other end round, and put a peg on it. Once in the tube, no bag was used to preserve any evidence, and D.S. Jones literally threw the moderator into the boot of his car. Was this because he was drunk, that he was negligent in his duties? He certainly was the worst for wear after drinking almost a whole bottle of whisky, as Peter Eaton informed the City of London Police in 1991. This was recorded in an officer's report dated the 10th of June 1991, which stated Mr Eaton 
briefly described D.S. Jones collecting the moderator from him on the 12th of August 1985. It would appear that he was offered a drink and accepted a whisky, but then went on to drink a large part of the bottle. Mr. Eaton stated that he offered to drive him back to Witham, but D.S. Jones declined. This may account for the throwing of the moderator into the boot of his car. Mr. Eaton was not impressed by this display of drinking and driving and never thought, when the drink was offered, that D.S. Jones would consume such a large amount. The following morning, when no doubt he'd sobered up a bit, D.S. Jones drove to Witham Police Station and showed D.I. Cook and D.I. Miller the moderator and especially the grey hair. Later that day, D.I. Cook took this moderator, DB1, and a second silencer recovered by the police, referenced SBJ1, to the lab at Huntingdon. By the time he arrived at the lab, this grey hair had now vanished. It wasn't seen or examined by any of the forensic scientists. The deception regarding the hair began during Jeremy's interview on the 12th of September 1985, in which Stan Jones stated to Jeremy, you see the silencer for that gun which I took possession of has on the end of it human blood. It also has a grey hair and see reddy coloured paint around the knurl. I believe the red paint comes from the wall in the kitchen where the stove is. The grey hair from your father and the blood from one of those murdered. That silencer was found. Stan Jones already knew the hair was lost. He knew there was no evidence whatsoever it had come from the scene, let alone Jeremy's father's head. On the 8th of May 1986, Essex Police raised Actions 1616, which stated what happened to the grey hair found by Peter Eaton and mentioned by D.S. Jones. The action was not accurate, however, as the hair had been seen by Stan Jones in the first instance. However, a statement was made provided by D.I. Cook to explain it was lost, and that should have been the end of it. However, that was far from being the case. During the trial, John Haywood, a forensic scientist who worked at Huntington Laboratory, was asked how the grey hair could, in his opinion, have been present on the silencer. As no hair was received at the laboratory, and consequently no hair was forensically examined, Mr Haywood speculated upon the circumstances of how a grey hair could have become attached. The prosecution and then the judge relied heavily upon the scenario that Hayward had created. In his summing up, the judge said, There is the matter that we heard about the grey hair seen on the end of the sound moderator, but which had disappeared by the time it got to the forensic science laboratory. Mr Rivlin reminded you in his closing speech that one of the experts, Mr Hayward, said in his cross-examination that in his view that hair could either have come because the sound moderator had come into contact with Neville Bamber's head in the fight in the kitchen. The judge raised this issue again just before he concluded his summing up and now said since that is a matter which has assumed some importance during the arguments you heard addressed to you by counsel i remind you perfectly what he said about mr haywood then he agreed that if there was a grey hair on the moderator it suggests that the moderator came into contact with mr neville bamba's head that could account for neville bamba's blood in the silencer it seems incredible that Judge Drake twice referred to the grey hair during his summing up, asserting speculative information from John Hayward as being fact. On both occasions, Judge Drake stated that the grey hair could have come from the moderator owing to it being in contact with Nimble Bamba's head, causing the hair to attach to the silencer. Therefore, did the judge misdirect the jury? He absolutely did. This was a hair which, according to the police, was missing, presumed lost, that had never been forensically examined, was not seen during close examinations of the moderator by the relatives and only appeared after Stan Jones had access to it. This should never have been presented as credible evidence at all. In preparation for the 2002 appeal, the CPS instructed the Metropolitan Police to collate evidence gather material and interview witnesses for the appeal. On the 26th of February 2002, DC West of the pre-appeal Stokenchurch Inquiry, which was conducted by the Metropolitan Police for the Crown, received a telephone message from DCI McDermid of West Hendon Police. She stated, 
I advised Mr. Bernard that D.I. Brown would meet up with him in order that he could view the action, in order to establish how the hair had become attached to the action. On the 4th of March, a further telephone conversation took place. The information contained on the message record stated, I received a call from Detective Superintendent Bernard. D.I. Brown had just left him after a meeting to discuss Action 1616 relating to the hair stuck to this action. Mr. Bernard has re-examined this action and recognises the writing in pencil as that of Stan Jones. He asked how I would like him to proceed with this information. I advised Mr. Bernard that I would prefer him not to contact Stan and the officers from this investigation would contact him to pursue the hair. Therefore, Stoke and Church had discovered that not only was there a grey hair attached to the original Essex Police action with sellotape, presumably stuck on by Stan Jones, but reveals further information. It states... Action 1616 relates to establishing what happened to the hair found on the moderator, was found to have strands of hair sellotaped to it. So Stoke and Church had therefore discovered the whereabouts of the missing grey hair, which now appeared to have morphed into multiple hairs sellotaped to the original Essex Police Action Report. D.S. Jones' handwriting had been confirmed on the Essex Police Action and Stoke and Church officers contacted him to interview him about this. After numerous failings, attempts to contact him by telephone and a succession of letters, three months later, D.S. Jones was finally interviewed. Stoke and Church must now have forgotten about the hair and failed to ask him anything about it. And conveniently, they also failed to inform the defence prior to the appeal. In 2011, the case files which had been provided to Jeremy's former QC, disclosed after the 2002 appeal, were finally handed to Jeremy and the campaign. Since then, the analysis of every single piece of paper has been conducted, in some instances multiple times, in order to extract the true events. And it was through this process that we discovered the information about the grey hair. So what we see with this issue is seemingly, yet again, another instance where Essex police deemed it necessary to fabricate evidence surrounding the alleged violent struggle in the kitchen at White House Farm. Not content with falsifying scratches to the Argus around and planting red paint flakes on a moderator, Essex police attempted to make the grey hair relevant. It would be of extreme interest now if we are able to obtain the original version of this action report 1616 with the hair or now seemingly multiple hairs actually attached to it by sellotape so that the DNA can be extracted to determine the source once and for all and to allow the misdirection of the judge in asserting that the hair came from the head of Neville Bamber to be argued. It'll be very interesting to see who this hair did come from and wouldn't it be coincidence if Jones was the owner of the hair. Next time, we'll examine the evidence from Jeremy Bamber's uncle, Robert Beauflan, who was a key prosecution witness and who shared a blood group with Sheila Caffell.